Welcome, good evening. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Hilary. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the New York Transit Museum. We really thank you for joining us for this evening's program, Transit and Ferry in NYC. We also invite you all to come and join us at the Transit Museum. It's a really wonderful space available for all people of all ages. Uh, we're located in downtown Brooklyn in a decommissioned subway station, which is open Thursday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We also have a gallery and shop in Grand Central Terminal. For today's program, if you'd like captions, uh, click on captions in the bottom menu and select show captions. If you don't see that setting, you can click on the three dots at the bottom of your screen and you'll get an expanded menu of options and you should find it there. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to ask questions and comments in the chat and we'll be monitoring that chat and uh, asking your questions at the end. So now I'm very pleased to introduce our presenters this evening. First, we have Franny Civitano, who works at the New York City Economic Development Corporation as the NYC Ferry Deputy Director. NYC EDC is New York City's nonprofit organization that oversees the NYC ferry system. As part of her portfolio, she oversees NYC Ferry's Policy, Planning, and Special Projects Group. She is also the co-vice chair for the Waterborne Transportation Committee as part of the UITP, which is the International Association of Public Transport. And before coming to NYC EDC, Franny worked for two private ferry operators and focused on community outreach, marketing, customer service, and the hiring and training of crews. Um, I thought this was a fun little ad. One of her favorite recent experiences was uh, managing a vessel naming contest where second graders got to propose names for NYC ferry boats that included Cyclone Shark, Dream Boat, and Ferry Gotham. Great names. Also with us this evening is Alan Olmsted. Alan has worked as a waterfront, ferry, and resiliency planner in New York for over 30 years. He led the city's initiatives that created the current generation of ferry terminals at Pier 11, East 34th Street, and elsewhere. He helped organize expanded ferry service in response to the flooding of the downtown path train tubes from the Northeaster storm of 1992, received a letter of commendation for his role in the ferry response to the first World Trade Center attack in 1993, and was awarded the Transportation 9-11 Medal by the U.S. Secretary of Transportation for his role in the waterborne evacuation of Lower Manhattan on that day, and also in the restoration of critical ferry service in the days that followed. Um, he holds degrees from Yale University and Princeton University and is a long-suffering Mets fan. Thank you, Franny and Alan, for joining us. I can now hand it off to you to take us through transit by ferry in NYC. Well, thank you to the Transit Museum. It's a wonderful place. You should all go. And it's a very important topic, transportation and transit in general, and one that doesn't get enough focus really, even by people who are experts in transit in New York City history, is the water ferries. Right now, what you have on the screen is what the ferry network in New York Harbor looks like now or slightly a little while ago because it's changing even as we speak. And just to give you a little overview of where we are now and then to take you through how we got there and then hand off to Franny to what's, what's, what's contemporary. Um, you'll see that Manhattan, Central Business District, lies at the center of a, a, of a large network of waterborne transportation. And you'll see it enters Manhattan through a series of gateways. In Midtown Manhattan on the East River, you see East 34th Street and West 39th Street, both intermodal gateways. You see the little bus symbol there because you access the interior by connecting from ferry to bus. And then in lower Manhattan, the financial district where much of the workplaces and other destinations are within walking distance of the waterfront. You have gateways at Wall Street, Pier 11, and Battery Park City on the west side, it's also been called the World Financial Center and also at Whitehall South Ferry at the world famous terminal of the Staten Island Ferry, the busiest single ferry route in all of North America. Uh, and you'll see that on the Hudson River, a lot of red New York Waterway and other companies and going down to Monmouth County on the inset there are privately operated companies that charge premium fares. And then on the East River and elsewhere, you have the, the city's own ferry service, NYC Ferry, which brings ferries to the city itself and residents at, at affordable prices and has been a remarkable success. But it didn't just happen. There's been a series of, of rises and falls. And now next. 
if you look at this region, one thing is the geography of this region is dominated by water. We live on a series of islands, peninsulas, or other types of coastal areas for the most part. And water has a double-edged quality to it. Water divides and water connects. If you don't have the right tools, water can stop, even a few hundred yards of water can stop you from, from moving and can find you where you are. If you have the right tools, water can take you to the ends of the world. And from the first peoples who came here thousands of years ago have used the waterways to connect different places in their lives. And when Europeans arrived in the early 17th century, the Dutch, who themselves are quite familiar with water, established various water routes between their settlements in Lower Manhattan, New Amsterdam, Brooklyn, and up the Hudson River to the various other parts of New Netherlands. But one thing all these forms of transportation, whether they were called ferries or not, had in common is that like every other form of waterborne transportation since the dawn of prehistory, when human beings first went into the water, is that we're powered by either wind, current, or muscle, whether human or animal muscle. And that changes really for the first time in the world in this harbor in the early 19th century. Next. When Robert Fulton and his colleagues introduced steam power into local boats, both ferries across the river and steamships going up to Albany. And it's really the first time that motive power, other than natural power, is used in transportation in a significant way anywhere in the world. Steam engines had existed stationarily for pulling like water, pumping water out of mines, but miniaturizing them to the point where you could put them on a boat was an important step towards what eventually railroads, cars, and little flying drones. And here you see Fulton Ferry Landing in, Man in Brooklyn, looking across at Fulton Landing, sorry, Fulton Street in Manhattan. And it's no coincidence that those two Fulton name places stare at each other still 200 years after his pioneering work. Uh, next. And over the next century, a huge network of ferries grew in this harbor, stitching together all these various islands, peninsulas, and coastal areas long before bridges and tunnels ever did. And a particular form of ferry evolved in this harbor that still exists today, a kind of monohull double-ended ferry that goes backwards and forwards with two wheelhouses, one facing one way, one the other, so it can reverse in place. And this form, which existed before the Civil War, about 20 New York ferries were commandeered into the Union Army to assist with river crossings in the South during the Civil War would be recognizable to someone who looked at the Staten Island Ferry today. Why double-ended? Why don't you just turn the boat around? Why go through the expense of having two sets of controls and two propellers? Well, it's because a lot of the ferries carried vehicles, even before cars. Next. You had wagons pulled by horses and then trucks. Not just commuters, but the commerce of the region moved by ferries fruits and vegetables being brought in from the farms of Long Island and New Jersey to feed the growing population of the city, construction materials, contractor supplies, goods for stores and warehouses moved by ferry. And a vehicle cannot easily turn around. So it goes in one and comes out the other. And therefore the double-ended ferry, which just reverses direction was ideally suited for this. You see some examples from 1878 and 1890 here. Next. But for the movement of people, intermodality really developed. The connection of the land-based transportation network with the water. On the left, you see South Ferry, which remains one of the places where the subway system truly meets the water. There's really only two places in the city I could think of where ferry, where subway stations are located right on the water. South Ferry is one. And this huge net network developed, co-developed between the Staten Island Ferry and its predecessors and the 
forms of transportation that took people to the interior. You see St. George on the right in 1929. And that same function exists today. And this is duplicated all over the city where trolleys or horse-drawn car horse drawn streetcar lines and, and later bus lines and extensions of elevated train lines went to the water to meet ferries. Next. And on the Hudson side, you had a different situation. You had a lot of ferries that were associated with intercity railroads. The main way to travel around the country until well into the 20th century was by railroad and Manhattan is an island, Brooklyn and Queens are an island. So if you wanted to take a rail journey to Washington, to Chicago, to California, to Denver, you got on a train either at Grand Central, which had a route up the Hudson and across, or you went to a ferry terminal on the west side of Manhattan on the Hudson River and took a ferry associated with your ticketed railroad and went across and took your trip. And to give you a sense context of scale, by the early 20th century, there were about 200 million ferry trips a day in New York Harbor, according to the great ferry historian, transit historian Brian Cudahy in his definitive book, Over and Back. 200 million a day. Staten Island Ferry before COVID was moving 25 million people a day. That's eight times the volume of the contemporary Staten Island Ferry moving throughout this harbor. About 95 or 100 million of that, almost half, was going to train terminals in New Jersey. Here you see the Pennsylvania Railroad's terminal. You see the West 42nd Street Rail Terminal over, ferry terminal over to the Jersey side next. But what happens to this network? Why don't you see all this today? Why, why do you see something different that came after, but not this? Well, things change. First, bridges started to conquer the East River. First the Brooklyn Bridge, then joined by the, by the Manhattan and the Williamsburg and the Queensboro. And for a period of time, ferries and bridges continued to coexist. There on the left, you see the Brooklyn Bridge in 1902 with ferry boats in the water. There you see on the right, the Williamsburg Bridge around 1920 with uh, a spur of the elevated train going down Broadway right to the water to meet the ferry. But gradually the conquest of the East River by bridges and tunnels, and especially by subway tunnels in the early part of the 20th century, displaced much of that traffic onto other forms of transportation that could offer a continuous ride. And you had this slow decline. And one of the blows to the railroad Hudson's ferries across the Hudson next was the development of Penn Station in 1910, which brought its own tracks across the Hudson River there or at 34th Street and the Long Island Railroad, which they own across the East River at 34th Street also into Penn Station. Prior to that, if you were on the Long Island Railroad coming in from Nassau or Suffolk, it took you to the somewhere on the water where you took a ferry into Manhattan or somewhere else in Brooklyn or Queens, maybe where you took the subway. But this allowed all that traffic to come directly into Penn Station. And what are now the Amtrak tubes across the Hudson allowed Pennsylvania Railroad passengers to go onward to Washington, Florida, anywhere in the world or anywhere in the country. Uh, without having to take a ferry and put give them a competitive advantage. And over time, uh, and it took a long time, uh, these ferries disappeared. And by 1967, the Hoboken to Barclay Street Ferry closed. Next. And you had only one publicly accessible ferry route left in the harbor, the venerable queen of, of, of New York ferries for, for time immemorial, the Staten Island Ferry. So if you visit in New York roughly for 20 years from 1967 to the mid 1980s, the only ferry you could really take anywhere was the Staten Islander. Yes, Governor's Island had a ferry to the military base there that was not open to the public. You could take a ferry to the Statue of Liberty, but that's a closed system, doesn't take you anywhere, just there and back within the confines. So, and that, but that started to change in the mid 1980s. 
What happened? What brought about a second era of ferries? A number of things. One is the same network of bridges and tunnels which had helped kill off the first golden age of ferries themselves became victim of choking congestion, uh, particularly the vehicular tunnels, Hudson River tunnels featured very, and bridge, George Washington Bridge featured long waits. Also changes in urban land use. Large areas of waterfront property, which generations earlier had been thriving industrial areas or shipping piers or rail yards, in places like Weehawken and Jersey City and Hoboken became vacant land and was being channeled into redevelopment as high-end housing. Housing located right on the water, far from other inland transit terminals that could benefit by direct connection. Also, ferries or boats in general were the one for form of transport that had gotten faster in the region. Uh, a rail, if you look at a railroad timetable for a trip from say Princeton, New Jersey to Manhattan from 1945, it's no faster today than it was then really, if you take the Jersey Transit. But faster boats were available to allow further away places like Monmouth County to take a shortcut by water and be faster. And you have an experimental growth or attempt at different routes starting in the mid 1980s. Next. And it took various forms. On the left, you see converted crew boats. Crew boats were built to take crews out to oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico and were available cheap at that time. They were designed to all passengers. They were sturdy, versatile, pretty quick side loading and could get in anywhere. High speed catamarans like the Sea Street boat you see on the right were tried out on the longer distance routes from places like Monmouth County where the water route was half the distance of the land route. Next. And then above all, you on the right, you see a New York Waterway monohull. New York Waterway, founded by Arthur Imperator, is really a great transportation pioneer. Kind of reef, acquired some property on the Jersey side in Weehawken in West New York to redevelop for housing and really rethought how to make a ferry work. He was a trucker, trucking magnet, and he figured out how to connect ferries and buses on the west side of Manhattan in a seamless trip and really introduced the modern uh, passenger monohull you see here, which many of the boats in the harbor are. It's like the old traditional bow loading New York ferry of yore, except it's single end because it doesn't have trucks or cars on board that can't turn around. People can go in one end, come up the other. It doesn't have to have two sets of controls and two buses. And smaller water taxis led by New York water taxis and people like Tom Cox and the Durst started to find niches for smaller routes or blending com commuting with recreation. The city adopted policies to encourage this, but to not subsidize the routes, but allow them to charge premium fares. So this was what the market would bear. It would tended to be routes that had well-heeled customers or great congestion or great volume. And um, one thing the city did do <clears throat> and the Port Authority and uh, did since much of the waterfront is in public ownership, and the waterfront is the key interface between the water and the destinations on the interior, we start to make landings available uh, first on an experimental basis to multiple operators and then to actually invest in strategically located infrastructure. Um, for example, uh, my mentor, Peter Halleck and I sat down and realized that Pier 11, the Wall Street Ferry Pier, which was an old pier infested by marine borers, which had maybe five years left before it had to be demolished, should be built into a new facility. We applied for grants and came out with a plan and worked with the Economic Development Corporation. Next. And here you see the current Pier 11 under construction in the year 2000, the Wall Street Ferry Pier. Next. And you see how well located it is to serve the financial district in that picture. Uh, and it went into service late 99, early 2000, was instrumental 
in, in many of the events that transpired afterwards. Next. Roots were tried, roots failed. Some places, people tried roots from Bayonne, people tried things from Yonkers, people tried things from all over. There was a lot of experimentation by having receiver terminals in the CBD that could accept these trips. You could allow people to try out different things from different places. If they failed, they failed. If they succeeded, they succeeded. There was a, not a lot of infrastructure to be built, like a, trying out a rail line where you better be sure the it's going to work. But when you look at the combined ridership of all of these services, on a year-over-year -year basis, it went up every quarter of every year from 1986 to 2001, every single quarter of every single year. And on the right, you see this huge spike, and that's the world after September 11th, 2001, for the next few years after that, while transportation was disrupted. Next. And one of the topics for this presentation is resiliency. Resiliency is the ability of a system to withstand a shock, a stressor, and still function and do what it needs to do. Get people to safety, get people to work, <clears throat> whatever. And the transportation network in New York has many different modes and has proved itself resilient, but it's also brittle in some ways. And Ferries add an extra layer of resiliency to a multi-layered network. And here are just a few examples of, of places where, where ferries have fit in. In 1988, inspectors found advanced corrosion on the Williamsburg Bridge, and it had to be closed almost immediately. Uh, since it was repaired and it's in fine shape today, but it was out of service. The Staten Island Ferry brought in their smaller night boats and established a service from Williamsburg to Lower Manhattan on relatively short notice. In 1992, Great Nor'easter Storm flooded out the downtown tubes of path. And we worked, my office, we worked with the ferry operators to increase ferry service for the week that that was out. Now, in retrospect, with sea level rise, that storm was the wake up call that didn't wake anybody up. Then in 1993, the first World Trade Center bombing, we were out there working with the operators almost hours afterwards on a plan for increased ferry service until PATH could be brought back on. There were preparations for various transit strikes, expected and real. The blackout of 2003, the miracle on the Hudson in 2009 where Captain Sullenberger landed that plane where he did because he knew there would be ferries available to come and pick up the passengers. But perhaps the best known and the most impactful and most dramatic example were the events of September 11, 2001, when the World Trade Center was attacked. And less well known, but also very impactful, is in the days and months after that, as New York tried to get back on its feet. Next. Oh, and, and you'll see on the thing, San Francisco, London, Istanbul, Japan, ferries have stepped in when other modes have been stressed. So, okay, sorry, next. So a lot has been written about the events of September 11th. A lot has been written about the Marine evacuation of Lower Manhattan on September 11th, 2001, in which an estimated quarter to a half a million people were evacuated in a matter of hours. More people, it's estimated, than were evacuated from the beaches of Dunkirk over nearly a week during World War II. Um, and there are great books on that subject. I recommend that you look at Dust to Deliverance or American Dunkirk or Calling All Boats or look at the work that Portside New York has done in documenting the oral histories and other histories from that day. And there are very dramatic photos taken from the west side of Lower Manhattan with boats coming against the seawall and people going over the railings into the boats. But I was on the east side of Lower Manhattan that day, so I'll describe a little bit from my perspective. Me and, and, my, and, and my coworkers, uh, Roy Salves and, and Matthew Winchell and Anthony DiGuglielmo, we were scattered that morning. We managed by various means to get to the pier. And realized that with PATH out, we didn't know what else was going on at first. 
that at very least with path outs, there'd be a surge in ferry passengers. And then as the day unrolled and it was clear what was happening, it became a torrent of passengers. In those pictures, you can see some of the smoke that was coming over from, from the Trade Center side, which by the crow flies is probably half to three quarters of a mile west of where we're standing in this picture. Next. Now, that morning, the Coast Guard Vessel Traffic Service sent out their uh, very famous call where Coast Guard Sector New York put out a call on the radio for all available boats to assist in the evacuation of Lower Manhattan and to come to Governor's Island to be organized. In our little part of the world on Pier 11, we didn't necessarily know that that was happening, but we saw the response. And you'll see um, in those pictures it, through the haze there, tugboats, tugboats and tugboats converging on Lower Manhattan. And many of them came to the West Side, but many of them came to Pier 11 because Pier 11 was set up to dock boats and transfer passengers efficiently. So we had, in addition to every ferry boat, we had dinner cruise boats, we had fishing boats, we had private yachts, we had dredge boats and work boats and tug boats and Army Corps of Engineer boats and anyone who could help. And next, and working with some of the Coast Guard and police folk who started to show up at the pier and even volunteers, people who were fire wardens from there Build, uh, office building and had their fire warden patch on, uh, volunteered. We started organizing people into basic lines, Brooklyn, New Jersey, Queens. Some people didn't care where they went. They just wanted to go anywhere. I remember one woman though, she asked where a particular boat was going to, and we said Jersey City and we told her where in Jersey City. She said, oh no, that's, not, that's the wrong end of Jersey City. And she wouldn't go on it. And said, "Well, we can. You can wait as long as you want." And sure enough, five minutes later, a boat came going to her part of Jersey City. So you never know. Uh, and and the picture is a little small, but you might be able to see something which is familiar in today's world of masks. It is a, a number of the people in that queue are covering their mouths with handkerchiefs or masks that they picked up. But it was very well organized, very well behaved. There was no panic. There was no disorder. There was very, no rudeness. Um, Next, but what happened after that day? Well, obviously in the days that followed, the main focus of government and private concerns was on search and rescue for survivors. That was the highest priority. The first responders who worked over at the site looking for survivors. But those in us in other fields still had things to do and think about. And one of the things was what would happen when Lower Manhattan reopen. How would you get people? PAC was out. The number one train through the Trade Center site was out. The NR train was out. The vehicular tunnels were under extraordinary security restrictions and were, for all intents and purposes, out. Uh, so on September 12th, DOT, whose own headquarters at that time, 40 Worth Street, was close enough to the Trade Center not to be damaged, but close enough that it was frozen. We can, no one could go there. Uh, we, we convened at a highway yard at West 158th Street and started reaching out to people to look for extra ferry service to, for Lower Manhattan. Um, and we ran it, managed to reach our counterparts in the ferry unit of the Port Authority. Now, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is an institution that had been decapitated by the loss of the Trade Center and, and by the death of their executive director. But the Port Authority ferry unit had actually been transferred to Newark several months earlier and was intact. So we reached them on the phone on the 12th. And we agreed that with the World Financial Center or the Battery Park City Ferry Landing now isolated by the World Trade Center site, you, that we would need a, something else in addition to Pier 11 closer to the west side. And Matthew Winchell, Anthony de Guglielmo went out and identified Pier A as the best site. Um, but at Pier 11, before that happened, 
uh, we went from 5,000 move, passenger movements a day before September 11th to in the weeks that followed 35,000 passenger movements a day, a sevenfold increase. So we had signed extra personnel to manage the queues and routes there. Hoboken service, which had never come around to the east side, came around. Uh, we rented tents so that people would have shelter as summer leaned into fall and fall leaned into winter. Um, all in all, the public agency, DOT, EDC, Port Authority, opened 14 additional ferry slips. A slip is like a loading spot in lower Manhattan between September 17th, 2001 and November 4th, 2001. Uh, at Pier 11, at Pier 15 and 16, and at Pier A. Um, next. And a lot, very few Northers even remember that there was a temporary ferry terminal built at Pier A, but it was, and it served for two years until PATH reopened. And the Port Authority built it. George Cancro, I've been told by two different people, I wasn't on this phone call, called up the Malcolm McLaren, the head of McLaren Engineering and the leading designer of ferry landings, said, start designing this terminal. You have my word, you'll be paid. And that was the initial contract. It had to be designed, permits from the Army Corps and State Department of Environmental Conservation. Rock sockets had to be drilled into the bedrock of the river there. And it was open within seven weeks. Next. And there it is you know, on a punch list trip about five days before it opened. Not very fancy, but it had like six or seven slips on it and did the job. Next. And here's a little snapshot in time comparing January 2002, about a few months after 9-11 with the world before it. And you'll see that service to the World Financial Center, which is on the west side, just past the World Trade Center site, although it had recovered a little, was less than half of what it had been. Pier 11 had more than doubled, and Pier A, which hadn't existed in a few months earlier, became the busiest ferry landing in the city other than the Staten Island Ferry Terminals. And there was an increase in service, Pier 78 and 78, or 78 and 79 from Midtown, into Midtown too, as Jersey commutation through Manhattan, some of it shifted to Midtown to come down to lower Manhattan. And in this, Post 9-11 world, and especially when the Bloomberg administration and Dan Doctoroff, who was the deputy mayor for economic recovery, came in, they started looking at, well, can we use ferries as a tool to engage in the recovery of lower Manhattan, not just fill in the gaps in commutation. Next. And uh, I apologize if these are a little small, but on the left is a ferry map from 2001, July 2001. And the other on the right is from May 2002, before and after September 11th. And you'll see how many more routes there are after because FEMA helped support temporary ferry service where there were subways or other transportation that was out of service as part of the federal relief. So a number of things were tried, some failed, some worked spectacularly. And you may see on this line, on the right, a ferry service going from Pier 11 to East 34th Street up to East 90th Street, an experimental East River intra-city service, one of the things tried. Um, and you'll also see a line going from the Staten Island Terminal to Brooklyn Army Terminal in Sunset Park. So the city provided service there while the NNR was compromised. This started in motion a rethinking of the policy that just let the operators land and serve you know, very rich markets, that they, they could be a tool to be used to accomplish other governmental aims, such as waterfront economic development. Whether you agree with that or not, it was a tool that allowed that to be supported. Next. And in that period, we continued to fill out that plan of having high quality gateway terminals in, no, yeah, right there, in um, 
West Midtown, East Midtown, and Lower Manhattan. Just as a new Pier 11 had been built, uh, we worked with EDC and the Federal Transit Administration to build a new East 34th Street terminal with greater capacity and greater amenities. And that's is it under construction. Many of you have been there if you've taken the East River Ferry. And another piece that a lot of, and there's the Empire Staple in the background. One piece that a lot of people may not remember is that New York made a serious bid for the 2012 Olympics. Next. And we lost that bid in 2005, but from 2002 to 2005, the city administration was frantically working on that bid. And it included a transportation plan called the Olympic X. And the entire north south part of that X was going to be Olympic ferry service with new ferry landings built all along the waterfront for, from, a, from service going from St. George to Staten Island on the south, all the way up along the Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan, and Bronx waterfronts to uh, the top of Manhattan, collect, connecting Olympic facilities and with ferry landings that would be left as legacies to be reused after the Olympics. The Olympics didn't happen, but a lot of the planners who worked on that plan came into the city government afterwards. And the idea of having the city contract for services that met public aims and could be made more affordable to ordinary people was very much in the air. It took a few years to get there, but by, the, by 2010 or so, the infrastructure was in place in Manhattan to receive it. The teams were in place. New folks were coming into city government. Uh, somewhere off at uh, Georgia Tech, uh, James Wong was working on his paper on pop-up transit, how transportation with a light infrastructure footprint could be started. He started with buses, but he would later join the team and come around to ferries and be instrumental, as Franny would. So it's now 2011. The city has studied everything about intracity ferry service. It knows how it can be done. The receiving part infrastructure is in place. The, the metaphorical winds of policy change are blowing. But little do we know that right around the corner, the actual winds, hurricane winds are also about to blow that no one expects. And I'd like to hand off at this point in time to my esteemed colleague, Granny Civitano, who is going to walk you through the amazing things that have happened since then. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, and thank you to everyone for having me. Um, we've covered, Alan just covered a, a lot of years um, in a pretty short amount of time. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly through 2011 to now. Um, and again, we're happy to take questions at the end. So um, <clears throat> as, Alan, as Alan said, there were, there were these thoughts about changes in policy. Um, and there were these investments that were made in uh, core business districts to accept ferry routes. And so in 2011, the Economic Development Corporation, I'll refer to that as EDC, um, where I work, launched a three-year pilot service called the East River Ferry. And this was the first kind of initial map before it got branded and beautiful and all of that. And the goal of the East River Ferry pilot was to see if people would use the service regularly. Could people get on a ferry to get where they're going? Are they gonna you know, pay $4 to do that? And they also wanted to see if it would encourage commercial and residential development along the waterfront. Um, for this pilot, the city provided a really modest subsidy, and EDC procured a, a private ferry operator, New York Waterway, who Alan mentioned earlier. Um, they used their own boats for the service. They did all the marketing, the scheduling, the signage. Um, and for this pilot, EDC projected about 400,000 people a year would take the service. Um, this is me in 2011. Um, uh, I joined the East River Ferry team the day after the service launched and I would remain a part of the team for the next five and a half years. I started out doing crowd control because um, this pilot turns out kind of hit the ground running and people really flocked to it. Um, and so we spent uh, a whole summer, uh, seven days a week, 
really managing crowds um, as people were getting on ferries and getting used to it. And it was quickly really becoming such an integral part of the fabric of all these communities that it served. And you know, ultimately it started as a test and people had their fingers crossed, I hope this works. Um, but those initial ridership projections of 400,000 a year, by the end of its first full year in service, it was over a million. And so it was quickly seen as, as fairly successful. So then by the next year in the winter, we get to Hurricane Sandy, which um, Alan alluded to earlier. <clears throat> um, and this is the same ferry landing that I was standing in front of in 2011. Um, this is North Williamsburg. And this was a really, um, obviously it was, a, it was a challenging time for New York and many other places. And there were some really devastating impacts of of this superstorm, um, but what we saw is that this was a really good reminder of how resilient ferries were. Because obviously we had to shut down the service while the storm was happening, but almost immediately once the the winds subsided, we were able to restart service and we were able to quickly reconfigure the routes. We kind of threw our our map out the window and we rerouted um, and had a lower Manhattan um, sort of circle and a and a midtown circle um, so that we could get people where they were going quickly. And so you see this single file line wrapped around that entire um, city block. And then in another part of the harbor uh, in Rockaway, which also just really saw devastating damage. Um, which included, there was some really substantial damage to the North Channel Bridge, which is the bridge that connects um, the Howard Beach uh, with Broad Channel. So there was no subway service in or out of Rockaway. And less than two weeks after the storm, EDC and the mayor announced um, that emergency ferry service would begin from a temporary barge at Beach 108th Street uh, to operate into Lower Manhattan during uh, weekdays from morning uh, and evening peak times for $2 each way. And this service was extended again and again, um, really because the, the community loved it and wanted to keep it, but eventually um, it did have to end in, in 2013 um, when there was no more money to fund it. Um, but by 2013, um, uh, there was this citywide ferry study that EDC conducted, and there was this question of, okay, if we were thinking about this as a system-wide, you know, unified um, uh, system and network, what could that look like? And so by the time Mayor de Blasio came into office, the goal was to have this such a system that unified uh, residential neighborhoods, recreational uh, waterfront areas, um, and job hubs together. Um, and that is exactly what we did. In 2015, it was announced that um, a citywide ferry service would come online with a network of six routes, one of those, the return of the Rockway service, um, and all for the cost of 275. So this was another kind of investment in making the service more accessible was taking the previous $4 East River fare and dropping it down to 275. Um, and less than two years later, in 2017, EDC had procured a ferry operator, this time a company called Hornblower. Um, we were building landings across the city, new vessels were under construction, um, and also a home port, which is a place where vessels go to be maintained and stored and fueled and cleaned. And by 2018, we had six routes in operation, dozens of ferries in the harbor or under construction. And in 2019, we announced the further expansion of NYC Ferry that would truly make the service a citywide service by connecting Staten Island to the west side. Um, and we also announced that we would go further into the Bronx. So here you see our current system map as of, as of today. And it is truly a sprawling system, six routes serving about 7 million people a year with 38 purpose-built vessels. Um, and I know that I've skipped you know, a lot from uh, the implementation to now, and I could probably talk for you know a week about um, all the nuance and all of that. But this is really a testament to the city's investment to create transit access and and use our waterways to connect us. And we have seen record ridership. NYC Ferry actually has the third highest um, return to pre-pandemic ridership. Um, we're 115% of what we, of the ridership that we had before COVID. 
Um, and we are looking forward to what's to come. Um, just some of the recent highlights. Last year, Mayor Adams announced the Ferry Forward Plan, which aims to make NYC Ferry more accessible, equitable, and financially sustainable. And I am pleased to say that just a little over a year from that plan's rollout, we have had some huge wins. We introduced a dynamic fare structure and expanded the discount program, which is growing tremendously. Um, we expanded our outreach program to get more people aware of what NYC Ferry is and what it can do. We've introduced creative new ways to offer service that also increase revenue, like the Rockaway Reserve, which happy to talk about if anyone has any questions about it. And um, we've introduced improvements to service that come at no cost, like our South Brooklyn Faster Connection service, which reduce travel time for riders from Bay Ridge to Lower Manhattan by about 20 minutes, which is really huge. And just two days ago, we announced that we successfully re-procured our ferry operator contract, which will introduce new rider facing amenities like free onboard Wi-Fi uh, and more expansive real-time service information and, and a lot more uh, improvements. So, this is all to say that we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish. And clearly, as you've seen, there's a lot of history um, that has gotten us here. And if you haven't already, I hope that you will go out and get on a ferry and see for yourself. That's it for me. Great. Thank you guys so much for, for sharing all this amazing information about ferries. Now it would be great to really open it up and see if anyone has any questions. Um, there were a few questions kind of earlier in that maybe I can kind of revisit. Um, there was some question about um, ferry service that has been discontinued over time. I wondered if you could speak to kind of what makes a service discontinued, how that, how that process is kind of determined and over maybe what time frame. Is this a um, general question or a historic um, question about, you know, pre 10 years ago routes? Well, the specific question was referring to Chelsea Piers, um, West 23rd, which I guess is no longer mm -hmm. um, an active site. Alan, do you know about that? I, I not sure if the top of my head exactly what happened with service vis a vis Chelsea Piers, but in general, uh, what makes a ferry successful or sustainable depends a lot on the the kind of policy regime in which you're looking at it. If 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 the policy is that only ferries that can pay their own way, even though all other forms of transit are have public investment supporting them, uh, then the only routes that'll happen are those routes that have access to great time savings, great volumes, and high paying passengers paying premium fares uh, to some extent. But if, it, if, you, if you have another measure of public good and it's the city deciding where they're going to go as part of an overall scheme, scheme of investing in transportation, then the criteria or what, what is successful is gonna be you know, very different. That makes sense. Um, there's another question here asking about speaking on ferry service to Coney Island. I don't know if there currently is or if that's in the works. Um, we, we did initially have a plan to launch ferry service to Coney Island. Um, we uh, do not have any active plans and I'm happy to send um, the link to, to that statement where you can find more information about uh, that process. Great. There's a question about how fast are the ferries? Um, our ferries, I can't speak for the Staten Island Ferry, um, but the NYC ferries uh, can go between 22 and 25 knots, um, which is pretty fast. It really depends on what part of the harbor they're in. So obviously, you know, the inner parts of the East River, like between Dumbo and, um, you know, Long Island City, they're not going to they're not gonna travel their fastest speed, but when they're going out to Rockaway, like that might be where they kick up the speed a little. 
the Staten Island Ferry, I think about 1516 knots. Now the fastest of the fast ferries, the longer distance high speed catamarans, there've been some in service that can do 35, 40 knots or more. But that's, that burns a lot of fuel. That's a very expensive technology to, to invest in and support. Uh, there, there's you know, certain diseconomies as you go faster and faster. And, and as Franny suggested, you, you have to be in a place where you can use it. You, know, you could go a thousand miles an hour in the congested part of the harbor and you're never gonna go a thousand miles an hour. You know. Um, and a not for, for not for those who don't who know not knots is uh, a nautical mile per hour. It's about one point one five uh, regular miles. So twenty knots is about twenty three miles an hour. Okay, great. Um, there was another interesting question that was kind of looking comparatively. Do you know of other cities in the country that have a similar kind of ferry service to New York? Um, or kind of made that same investment. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, there are there are a few ferry services that we consider to be close to NYC Ferry. There's one in San Francisco that's um, overseen by WIDA, the Water Emergency Transportation Authority, um, and they also their ferry service was born out of um, you know a time of emergency when, when um, you know, redundant uh, transportation was really was critical. Um, and they still exist today. They have several routes in the, in the San Francisco Bay area. Um, and they have a, a, a fleet size that, you know, is not too far off from, from us. Um, there are other passenger only ferry services in the country, New Orleans, um, uh, Seattle, Obviously, um, there's also, you know, Seattle has, uh, or the Washington State Ferries also takes cars, but they also have a pretty huge um, passenger only ferry operation. And then there are tons of services across the world as well. Um, London, Hamburg, obviously, um, you know, Venice. Yeah, but New York uh, of, uh, has the most ferry ridership of any ferry in the country, of any city in the, the country. But, and the, you know, Franny alluded to the Water Emergency Transportation Agency in, uh, in California. Uh, for those of you who've gotten a taste for ferry presentations and, and just need more after this, if you can look up online the press conference in which the formation of WIDA was announced. It was when Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor of California. And it's actually quite interesting to see a presentation on ferries and the arguments for ferries being delivered by Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's got a certain way. I know you mentioned earlier the, the Rockaway Reserve. I don't know if you wanna to give a little explanation of what that program is. Yes. Um, if you've ever taken a ferry, one of our ferries out to the beach um, on a summer weekend, you might have experienced uh, waiting in line, maybe sometimes for more than one boat to get there. Um, it's a very popular service and it's kind of the best deal in town. You know, for four dollars, you can hop on a boat to the beach. Um, it's really quite an amazing way to get there. Um, so last year we launched a pilot called the Rockaway Rocket, um, which took a dedicated boat that we would reserve, you know, where you had to buy a reserve ticket in advance. So you were guaranteed a specific time. Um, and while that was really successful and a really interesting pilot, what we found um, this year is we launched a service called the Rockaway Reserve where we, um, instead of having a full dedicated boat that if, you know, say there's bad weather or something, um, then we might have an empty boat. We allow people with the Rockaway Reserve to, um, during the, you know, the peak times that people wanna go to and from the beach, you can reserve a limited number of tickets on every ferry for $10. So it's a higher price, but you're guaranteed that you know, to board at that time. And so you can avoid waiting in line. 
Um, and we're finding that it's been a really successful program. It's bringing in some extra revenue. Um, people really like the ability to plan in advance. Um, and it's, you know, we're still able to keep most of the boat unreserved so that people who, you know, want to pay $4 or use their discounted ticket at $1.35 can still, can still take the ferry. So it's been a very fun um, beach service. That sounds great. I've definitely taken the ferry to the beach and it's a great ride. Um, there's one question here that might be a really good kind of wrap up question um, asking what will ferry service look like 100 years from now? Um, what do you see as kind of the role of ferries? Do you see it expanding or changing? Alan, I would love to hear your take on this. You you brought us from 100 years. Take us 100 years in the future. Well, I haven't actually been working on them for 100 years, but uh, <laughs> the I think they'll still be around. I mean, I, I think water is a very efficient way to convey things. I mean, it takes less fuel to move a ton of freight by water halfway around the world than sometimes it does halfway across town on a truck. Um, you know, even if technology allows all sorts of flying and such 100 years from now, there's just a tremendous efficiency for, from, for moving things by water. And uh, an unshakable and unmitigatable beauty to it. There's something about being on the water, which inspired people th thousands of years ago, poets and ordinary people, and inspires them today. And I, I can't imagine there's any reason that if we've got people 100 years from now, knock on wood, that they, they, they won't feel exactly the same about water. Um, it may be, there'll be different technologies, different ways of doing it. Some of the same ways, like we've had ways which, you know, a Staten Island ferry boat that traveled back in time to 100 years ago could probably dock. Um, you know, will we have amphibious craft taking freight across the harbor, allowing single trip rides so you don't have to transfer? A bus picks you up at your hotel in Midtown goes into the water and drives on to the airport and takes you to your plane. If planes last longer than ferries, ferries might last longer than planes. But they'll be here. Uh, but uh, what they'll be and what they'll look like, I bet some of them will st still be painted New York City municipal arms though. So. <laughs> My favorite color. I love that answer. Um, any other thoughts to add, Franny, or? I, I, I agree. And I just hope that whatever those fairies are named in the future, we ask our second graders to do it. I, uh, I, I like that idea as well. That's fantastic. Um, thank you, Franny and Alan, so much for coming and sharing your expertise and your information about fairies. It was really uh, a lovely program tonight. And thank you all for joining us and spending your time with us at the Transit Museum. Um, we hope you're all inspired now to take a ride on a ferry if you're coming through New York City um, and you see all the many routes and uh, travel destinations you can go and, and do that. Uh, I just put a few links in the chat. Um, we just want a couple final messages, words. We invite you to join us all at the museum. You can reserve your tickets on our website. Also, if you enjoyed this program tonight, please consider making a donation or becoming a member, helping us keep our programs going. Um, we hope you can join us for more upcoming virtual events, which you can find on our website. Our next program is going to be Thursday, August 24th at 6 p.m. That's about moving image media in transit. And you can learn about the uh, mass transit scope if you've seen that on the QOB line. Um, on September 6th, we'll have Kenneth Gold join us to talk about his book, The Forgotten Borough. Um, Staten Island and the subway. So our virtual programs are free and you can register on our website. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Conad, for supporting our virtual programs. Thanks again. Have a wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend and we hope to see you in a couple weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.